a little bit of the historical context, and what sort of text it is, particularly this idea of the way it links with prophetic texts. Um, the next two parts we're going to look at are the structure of the text. How do we read this text, particularly thinking about the sevens, uh, and then this idea of if you had to kind of summarise what's the main theological message of this book. So I've tried to summarise it in like two short sentences. Uh, so you can see if you might all totally disagree with me. Uh, so we'll have a look at that. So how is the text structured? Uh, how do you read a text like the book of Revelation? Um, a crucial factor in the structure of Revelation is undoubtedly the repeated series of sevens. So we've already mentioned one of them uh, before the break, the letters to the seven churches. So you get in chapters two to three, letters to seven churches. There's already this series of sevens that happen there. In chapters six to eight, you get the opening of the sealed scroll, the seven seals, the famous Ingmar Bergman uh, film, uh, the seven seals. Um, so what happens is the lamb is given the scroll, this sealed scroll uh, by the one on the throne, and each of these seven seals are opened in turn, uh, and various things happen as each seal is opened. And that takes you through from chapter 6 through to 8. Uh, slightly later, you get in chapters 8 to 11, a series of seven trumpets are blown. Um, so you move from seven seals being opened to seven <coughs> trumpets being blown. Uh, and then a little bit later on again, you've got these angels pouring out these seven bowls of kind of judgment on the earth in chapters 15 and 16. So again, a number of times you get these series of sevens that happen. Seven letters, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Um, so how do you then read a text that's structured uh, in this way? And again, there was someone I mentioned before the break, one of the earliest commentators we have on the book of Revelation. He was called Victor Rias, who is a bishop of Poetovio in what's now Slovenia. Um, and so there were other uh, extracts on the book of Revelation written before him, but he's the first full commentary that survived right in the third century. Uh, and already when he was looking at this idea of the sevens, um, he talked about them being um, a series that goes back on itself, that recapitulates itself. It doesn't just go from beginning to end, right the way through the book, but each time you come to the end of one series of sevens, it goes back again and comes round. Um, and this has been one of the key questions about how you interpret the book of Revelation. Does it just unfold from beginning to end, or does it cycle back on itself in this series of sevens? Um, so if you look, um, again, just a simple diagram to explain what I mean. Um, as you work your way through the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, when you get to the seventh item each time, does the next one just continue on? So you reach a certain point in time, and then it continues on, and each one you're getting nearer and nearer to the end. Uh, is that what's going on? That's how many people read the book of Revelation. It just unfolds like any other normal book you read from beginning to end. It's talking about time kind of unfolding towards the end, and as you work through each of those series, you're getting a little bit nearer to the end. Um, so that's just kind of chronological progression. Um, another way of reading it, from very, very early on, from some of the earliest commentators on this text, they read it as going back on itself, spiralling back on itself. Uh, this idea, of, you'll see it referred to as recapitulation, just something kind of recurring, going back on itself. Uh, that when you get to the seventh item each time, you can't go any further. That's kind of an image of the end time, of the heavenly realm, and then you come back to the beginning again, and then work to the, the end once more. Um, so on this reading, the end is described at the close of each series of sevens. So every time you get to the seventh item, you get to kind of the end, the heavenly Jerusalem, the end time, and then it tells you a little bit about it, and then it begins again, and then it gets to that point again. So it just keeps coming back to that same uh, moment. So this is the, there's an English translation now of Victor Rhinus's commentary, uh, and various other early uh, patristic commentaries on Revelation including Bede, lovely Bede, uh, wrote a commentary on Revelation. Um, the author of the earliest surviving commentary written on the Apocalypse, Victor Rhinus, talked about this idea of recapitulative reading, and that it goes back on itself. He says, do not regard the order of what is said, because the sevenfold Holy Spirit, when he's run through matters down to the last moment of time and the end, returns again to the same times and completes what he has left unsaid. So he talks about this text coming back on itself you get to the seventh item, which is kind of the end each time, and then you come back again and say a little bit more about it, and then a little bit more about it. Um, so that's already a different way of reading uh, this text, taking these seven seriously. Uh, many commentators, I just put down the bottom, 
uh, some very famous ones like Schuster Fiorenza, for example, um, tries to incorporate a little bit of both. That it's like a spiral that kind of widens out as it works its way through. Now, there is progression as it works its way forward, but it also kind of comes back on itself, just a little bit of both. Um, so this text is a kind of a complex text to read, this idea of sevens, these recurring sevens, and that it moves forward but it also returns. Because as you'll see, if you look at some of uh, items one, two, three, four, five, six. There'll often be connections between the seals and the bowls and the trumpets. The sixth item in each one might have some similarities with one another. So there's connections between them. It's the way you read the text. It may be more complex than it initially looks. Is there a sense of spiraling back on itself, coming round on this idea of seven? Um, and certainly, you've got this idea of at the heart of the book is this idea of sevens. This idea of sevens for kind of completeness. Um, so that's one element of um, uh, this idea of this, the sevens is, is really important to the structure. Another thing that's really important to see in relation to the structure um, is the kind of movement uh, between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm that keeps happening. Uh, scholars who study the structure of Revelation universally acknowledge the series of sevens, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, as of supreme interpretative significance. They're very, very important to understand this text. Uh, this is undeniable. Yet, if we focus our attention on the seventh item in each series, we glimpse a parallel golden thread that can be traced through the text, visions of heavenly worship in the celestial temple. So I'll just I'll move this forward and then come back again. Because what happens, what tends to happen when we read the book of Revelation, the bit we remember the most are the bits with the monsters and the fire and the violence. Uh, they're the bits we kind of remember the most. Uh, and they are generally in the bits of trumpets one to six, seals one to six, bowls one to six. They're not the most important bit in the book. But our eye gets kind of attracted by the monsters and the violence and the blood and the various things, that chaos that's going on, um, to not realise that the most important thing is this scenes of heavenly worship that round off each of the sevens. It's where the book opens in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, uh, this vision of heavenly worship in, in the heavenly temple. Each of the sevens, there's this moment of heavenly worship at the end of each of the sevens. And then the final vision of the book, the New Jerusalem, is a vision of kind of heaven on earth, heaven as earth. The most important bit within the book isn't the monsters and the violence and the blood. That's not the most important bit. Um, the crucial thing is, is this idea of um, this breaking down of the kind of barriers between heaven and earth. What you get in the final vision in the New Jerusalem is there is no heaven and earth anymore. There's just one sacred place where God dwells with humanity. Um, it's kind of heaven on earth, heaven as earth. There is no heaven up there and earth down here where God is somehow separate from humanity. God dwells with humanity in one place <coughs> by the end. It's, and so the whole text is about this breaking down of those barriers between heaven and earth. Uh, the most important thing is worship of God, in originally in the heavenly temple, and by the end in the, the kind of New Jerusalem. That's the most important thing. That's what the text is trying to encourage you to see. This is the goal it's setting before you. Um, so I was speaking to a gentleman there during, during the break, and one of the things that often people kind of get a sense of when they read the book of Revelation is it's all quite violent and there's monsters and it's a bit frightening. Um, but the key thing it's trying to encourage you uh, to see is that it's much more about the relationship between God and humanity and dwelling together. That's what the goal of all this is. Um, and all it's trying to do, in part, is encourage you to focus on that um, and not misbehave so you end up in the lake of fire with the badges. Um, you want to end up in the New Jerusalem at the end. Um, the most important thing is this worship of God in the heavenly temple, the worship of God uh, being in the presence of God. That's the key thing that's going on in the book. Um, our eyes are always attracted by the monsters and the dragons and the various other things, but they're just the baddies and they're going to get removed. They're just of this age which is passing away. They're not the important thing. The danger is we get focused on them, fixated on them. They're not the most important thing. When the final battle happens in the text, it lasts about one verse and there's no violence at all. They're just easily dismissed. They're no real rival at all. Um, they're losing 100 near in the football game. They're, they're really not alive. Um, so the key thing in this text is this idea of the movement between God and humanity, this kind of worship in the heavenly temple. Yeah? Oh, right. Just, um, it's to do with the structure, because you get these series of sevens, uh, and what often happens is you get the first four bits, then there's a bit of an interlude, and then another three. Um, so it's just the interludes within the series of seven. So for example, you get, uh, which one? For example, the, um, the seals. 
um, you get in, I um, know, oh, sorry, this is more the, yeah, the seals, where you get the first uh, four seals together, and then you get this little kind of interlude in chapter seven, where everyone's sealed in the heavenly temple. There's a bit of a gap and interlude, and then it goes back to the numbers again. So it's just a kind of interlude. If you think of it as like a, I think they get the idea from kind of operas and things, it's, it's, it's almost like the little interlude that happens in the main action. Um, so the structure gets a little bit more complex within the sevens. You get various things happening in order, and there's a bit of a gap, and then it comes back to the order. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, if there's things you don't, uh, no, do you always ask? Um, so this idea of um, the key thing being about this kind of relationship between heaven and the earthly realm, and worship of God. Uh, Revelation's visionary imagery operates on two planes, the temporal and the spatial. Uh, so temporal, this idea of time, uh, these visions describe imminent events in historical time, the unfolding of divine judgment, culminating the final defeat of the anti-god forces. So you get the beast and the dragon, the baddies, uh, through seals one to six, trumpets one to six, bowls one to six, you get the defeat of the baddies. Um, but spatially, you also get at the end, in these seven items each time, the eternal realities of the celestial realm, specifically visions of heavenly liturgy in the celestial temple, seal seven, trumpet seven, bowl seven, the new Jerusalem in the end. Um, at the culmination of each of the series of sevens, the seer describes a scene of heavenly worship in the celestial temple. The future hope is of the realisation of present heavenly reality on earth as it is in heaven, when the gap between these realms is collapsed. So what, the, what you really the aim to focus on is what's going on in the heavenly realm. And it's all about uh, this idea of making what's going on in heaven now the reality, um, living in that kind of way of worshipping God, uh, not focusing on the kind of temporal stuff that's passing away, uh, not being seduced into worshipping the beast, into idolatry, worshipping the wrong thing. They're all passing away, they're irrelevant. The important thing is what's going on in heaven. And that's why you get in chapters 4 and 5, the seer going up to heaven and giving you, this is the heavenly viewpoint, this is really what's going on. Who's really in charge of the world? It's God. The creator is the ruler of the world. It might seem like it's the Roman Empire, it's not. They're passing away, they're irrelevant. Don't get seduced by them. Um, so it's all about that. And so although we always read these texts and we think, oh, monsters, brilliant. Um, that's not the most important bit. Um, and, and similarly, the violence, when you see, it often seems quite a violent text, but when you get to the set-piece battles, there's no fighting even occurs. Um, because the Lord defeats the baddies with the word of his mouth. It's through the preaching and the prophecy. There isn't any fighting in the world. Um, and so that's the key thing. Um, and this then leads into my answer to the life of the universe and everything. So what is the book of Revelation uh, all about? Uh, oh, sorry, I've just got pictures of nice books you might be interested in, in on this topic, sorry. Um, so there's various studies of kind of heavenly worship in the apocalypse. Uh, a couple of very interesting chapters, one by Leonard Thompson, uh, he's got a very good chapter on uh, worship in Revelation. Uh, the more recent study by Gordon Campbell, uh, narrative reading of Revelation, really good section on liturgical imagery and language in the book. Uh, and this other more recent study on the hymns. The book is absolutely full of hymns, uh, hymns and praise and thanksgiving of God. But we're so busy watching the monster, we miss the hymns. Um, so I'm now going to summarise. This is the, the message of the book of Revelation in two sentences. Um, this is what it wants you to do. This is what it's trying to persuade you to do. Two things. Worship God and witness to the testimony of Jesus. Just two things. The key thing, the one we'll focus on in the session after the break, worship God. That's the key thing. Everything else is distraction. All the other monsters and beasts and Roman empires, they're idolatrous, they're passing away. Forget about them. They're a distraction. Worship God. And then the second thing, as I said, like you get in the letters to the seven churches, witness to the testimony of Jesus. Your witnesses uh, to this testimony that's being disclosed to you. The book of Revelation describes itself as the testimony of Jesus, the prophecy of Jesus. Um, this has been just revealed to you. You just need to keep with it, stick with it, no matter what. Uh, that's what the book of Revelation is about, in my, in my opinion. Uh, other scholars may disagree. Uh, witness, worship God and witness to the testimony of Jesus. And we'll focus on the first part, as I said, after the break. But already those two key words open up a number of questions, don't they? Worship God. What do we mean by God? What do we mean by worship? And that was from the, uh, the Ghent altar piece. So worship God. It says it emphatically in Revelation 19.10 and 22.9. Um, so this will flow into the nuanced theological reflection on the nature of God in the Apocalypse. Again, because it's full of weird imagery, you don't notice, but it's one of the most 
subtle and nuanced and thoughtful reflections on who God is in the entire New Testament. Uh, but it's done in images rather than just set out in, in clear sentences. So it's harder sometimes to get a grasp of. Um, so who is God? And we'll look at this again in, in the second half after lunch. Um, of particular note is the threefold kind of Trinitarian understanding of the one God in the Apocalypse. Because this is crucial. Worship God, but it's the triune God. Um, it's he who was and who is and who is to come. It's the seven spirits of God, this kind of seventh sort of old spirit, and it's Jesus Christ the Lamb. It's this triune God that's to be worshipped, um, which is very, very important to see within the book of Revelation. What do we mean by God? Um, it's Father, Son, and Spirit. It's God to be worshipped. Uh, and what is true worship of God? Um, unceasing worship of the one God, the creator, the redeemer, and ruler of all creation. Uh, worship of God emanates outwards in concentric circles from the inner sanctum of the heavenly temple. We'll see this in chapters 4 and 5 this afternoon. Uh, to encompass universal praise by all creation. And the aim is not just worship of God in the heavenly temple, but God is creator of all. It's worship of God by all creation, every created being. Every created being in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, to worship God. <clears throat> and all other worship is false worship. It's the idea of worshipping the Roman Emperor, or any other deities, false worship, idolatry. Um, and so you get in chapters 13, for example, uh, in, in Revelation 4, you get this, in Revelation 4 and 5, you get worship of God and the Lamb in the heavenly temple. We'll look at that this afternoon. Um, in chapter 13, you get kind of a fake version of that. You get the dragon enthroning the beast. It's like a fake version of that. And because you've already seen chapters 1 and 5, you know it's a fake version, so you don't need to get seduced by it. Um, worship of the one God, the creator, the redeemer of the cosmos, uh, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, anything else is idolatry and false worship. That's what the book wants you to do. It's about disclosing the true heavenly reality. Who's really in charge? God, the creator and redeemer in heaven. What you get by this seer's vision of the heavenly realm is the kind of secret history of the world. Who's really in charge? It might not be what you think. Uh, if you see things from God's perspective, from the heavenly perspective, God, the creator and redeemer, is in charge. He alone is the one you should worship. Um, and you worship because you're creation. You're created by God. It's all creation worshipping God. Um, and that's what the book is mainly about. Uh, worship God. Um, and then the other bit 